Tell that. All right, you do that. Take a book with you. I'm nervous too. It's okay. I've already done this once and it was fine. Yeah. Basically, I, the same thing again. Yeah. Hey, hey, Kelly and Kai, you have your sound on. Right. All right. Make sure, make sure Kayla keeps her cool. Tell her she can't tell the attorney. I would never do that. All right, um, Ms. Winkles, if you'd like to call your next witness, please. Yes, Your Honor. I'd like to call Deputy Kelly Madison to the stand. Um, what is your job? I'm employed with the deputy as a deputy of the Cowles County Sheriff's Office. Okay, and how long have you worked for Cowles County Sheriff? November, at least 16 years. Okay. And do you remember an incident that occurred on 337 King Road in Silver Lake, Washington on June 12th of 2021? Yes. Okay. And I now I provided you with the police report. Is that correct? Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's Exhibit 39. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. Okay. Go ahead and can you tell me what you remember from that incident? Uh, it was me and Deputy Prater. We were dispatched to what was a DV. It was a report of a male assaulting other people at the house. I was responded first. I was closest. Okay. And when you responded, what did you notice? Uh, there was several females outside. Uh, dispatch had already said that the person I was assaulting had already left. So it's couple of females outside, so I just interviewed him to find out what was going on while other deputies were responding. Okay. And did you see any of the females with any injuries? Yes. Um, can you tell us about those injuries? Uh, Kelly Crape said that she got punched and she had a small cut in the inside of her mouth on her lip. Okay. Any other injuries did you notice? No. Okay. And uh, the females, do you remember who you spoke to that day? Uh, I believe it was someone, it was Taylor, a uh, person with the last name of Boone, I think it was, what, Caitlin? And then Kelly Crape. Okay. Did you also speak to Teresa Ludwig? Uh, I don't believe Teresa was there. She is the grandmother. I believe she left with uh, uh, the suspect. Okay. Um, when you spoke to them, were all of their narratives pretty much the same? Yes. Okay. And can you tell me what they um, they told you? They'll obviously be on the stand as well, but can you tell, tell me what, um, what they told you happened? They had confronted um, Mr. Ludwig. And he was getting angry. It's Kelly's residence with Ludwig's father. She didn't like the way she was being talked to. Uh, he was using some vulgarities to her. She told him to leave. He left for a little bit and then came back and was angry. And at that point, uh, him and Kelly were face to face. And then he punched Kelly in the face. And then basically the other females all came in and tried to break it up and step in there. Okay. And did you, um, at any point after hearing that story, did you, were you able to interview um, Jaden Ludwig as well? I never spoke to him. Okay. Um, did you speak to anybody else involved? No. Okay. Um, to the best of your knowledge, was Mr. Ludwig arrested that day? He was by Deputy Prater. Okay. Um, do you know of any other outcome um, of this case? Let me rephrase that. Um, do you know of the outcome of this case? I'm going uh, What's that? I'm, oh, not, I'm objecting to, to well, I mean, how he would know or why he would know or what he's going to do. Yeah, so, so the objection is noted as to, does he know the outcome of the case? Uh, he can answer if he knows. I have no clue. After he was arrested, I I never went to trial on it, and I don't know what happened with it after that. Okay. Um, and who, do you remember the name of the person that called it into the police? Uh, I don't, but I can look it up. Okay. Would it, would it be in your report? Most likely. If not, it's on the dispatch notes. Okay. Um, and it also says that you you submitted another report on 614 um, where it said that you spoke with Larry, uh, Teresa Ludwig. Do you remember that? Uh, it's it's at, yeah, it's at um, bait stamped 535 of that information I gave you. Did you, uh, did any of the, I'll kind of change tactics a little, did any of the females who were trying to get um, Jaden off of Kelly, did they disclose any? Any injuries to Jaden from their actions? No. Okay. Um, and what made this case uh, assault for DV? Because that's what he was arrested for. What would it have made it, it that type of? It's because the Kelly was his stepmom. It's okay. the parental relationship. Yeah. I have no further questions. Okay. Uh, Cross examination. None, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Uh, any objection to excusing Deputy Patterson? Absolutely none. None, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, Deputy. You're free to go. Thank you. Have a good day.
And you're on our motion to admit 39. I think it was in an ER 904, but just in case. Um, your Honor, I'd like to call um, Sherry Farr to the stand. Um, Ms. Farr, how many times have you been appointed by the court in Calvinus County to act as a Title 11 GAL? Uh, so I am a Title 11 um, for adults and minors in at least two counties right now. So I have a I know that the total is about 400 cases total. I I don't know what the breakdown is. Okay. And when did you start uh when did you start your career uh, as a Title 11 GAL for the children part of it? When the new uh, UGA statute became effective in uh 20 Gosh, was it I can't remember it was January 2020 or 2021. I think it was 20. I'm not sure as well. It all blurred together. <laughs> yeah. um, and had you ever worked with children before as a GAL uh, under Title Title VI or Title any other um, children GAL work? Uh, no, not prior to that. Okay. It, unless it unless it involved um, you know the the children that were involved in any of the adult custody uh, any of the adult guardianship cases. Okay. Um, and since uh, since the change in the law. Um, tell me what percentage of your work are cases of Title XI minor guardianships? Um, more than, well, more than half, probably two thirds. Okay. And to the best of your knowledge, um, how many Title XI uh, guardians um, are available in Cowlitz County for minors? So how many... How many, people, how many how many GLs are still on the registry for minor guardianships under Title 11? Um, right now, there's just two of us that are uh, on the list, and I believe I'm the only one that's active right now. Okay. And we, we, we did have four until okay. just recently. Now we have, now we're down to two. Okay. And how, how many current cases do you have that are in active litigation? It's not the ones that are sitting and waiting for years, but how many active cases in litigation? Oh, gosh. You know, I probably have somewhere between 15 and 20. Um, on this particular matter, tell me what was the nature of your appointment? Uh, well, it initially started with an emergency petition. So initially I was appointed as the court visitor to determine whether uh, to make recommendations, whether the emergency guardianship should be put in place for the child. Okay. And and you had been appointed in the past to support visitor in other cases, correct? Yes. So take me through, um, so you're appointed court visitor of this case. Take me through the steps that you did on your investigation um, to come up to your conclusion. So let's start with, um, you just start at the very beginning. You get the order, you're appointed, then what? You're talking about just as the court visitor appointment, because I also was appointed as the GAL later just on. As, just as okay. the court visitor, yeah. So as the court visitor, um, the steps that I take are to, um, I, I download all the documents, I review them, I open a trial, I open a, uh, a notebook, and then I begin my in interviews. And I usually start with the petitioner and the child, and then I go to the parents. In this case, um, I was contacted by a uh, father the day I was appointed before I even knew I was appointed. So my, my interviews began with him first. Um, uh, once I interview, then if there's records to gather, I gather records. Um, and I usually talk to the parties more than once, because when I learn from one interview, then I need take that information and I go back to the other parties and, and talk to them about that information. Um, and then I make recommendations according to uh, the statutory requirements. Okay, so going to this case specifically, now that we know it. So you, you've downloaded the stuff, you've got your file notebook together. You said you interviewed father first. Where did that interview take place and how long was it? Um, my my first interview was by phone um, and that was on October 20th. Um, and that was about 45 minutes. Okay. And during that call, was dad the only one you talked to or was there anyone else on the line during that initial father phone call? His girlfriend, Michelle Harrington, was also uh, on the phone call. Okay. And from that first phone call, what, what did you learn about the case? Well, I learned what uh, father's position was, um, that he told me that I was appointed, that there was, had been a petition filed, 
um, that he had sole custody of the child, um, where he, I gathered basic information where he lived. Um, and where did he say he lived at that point on October 20th? Uh, he told me that he lived in Reed's court on, Reed's uh, court. um, with his mother in a 36 foot trailer. Okay. Um, and did he give you, did you, uh, find out the location of where the call was taking place from in that particular time? Not at that time. Um, I think, that, I think that he represented to me that he was calling, um, from having just come from the courthouse. Okay. And did you find out at that initial call, whether or not dad was employed? No, yes. I'm sorry. That was one. I, I couldn't hear. Whether or not the father was employed, whether or not he had a dog. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. He told me that he was uh, employed doing DoorDash full time. He also told me that he was um, that he was doing DoorDash, but that he was doing that in Silverton because he was temporarily at his girlfriend's house. Okay. In, also in Silverton. Okay, so he said he's temporarily at his girlfriend's house. Did he go into any more detail about being temporarily there? No. Okay. Um, and did he disclose any adults living, or did you ask whether or not any adults were living in that residence? He did not disclose any other adults. And um, my notes don't specifically say that I asked him if anybody else was living there during that initial phone call. That call was kind of off the cuff, so I didn't have my normal guide, guidelines that I go by to ask questions. Okay. And additionally, when somebody says that they're staying somewhere temporarily, for example, a week or a few days, is it under the guardian ad litem's duties under your, your set of rules that you have to inquire um, uh, about criminal records of people that live there? This question is really bad. What I'm trying to say is, at, based on the rules and based on your training of a guardian ad litem, at what point does a guardian ad litem be put on notice to do a deeper investigation of the place where somebody is staying. So obviously if he says it's temporary, maybe he means a week, do you do it on that? Or is it only if they're residing there? So usually, um, and I would say in, I would say in all my cases so far, I only um, dive deeper when I, when I am given the residential address and where that potential, where that child will be potentially living. Okay. And so that was your initial phone call. And then did you, who did you speak to next? Um, so the next call was uh, to the petitioners uh, who I then scheduled a meeting, the, my Zoom meeting with. Um, and I had called them within a couple of days after that. Um, and then I met with them via Zoom on November 2nd. Okay. And how long did you meet with them for? For an hour. And there were two of them and the children or and the child? Okay. Yes. So typically I meet with the petitioners first um, and, and ask that the child not be present, which I did in this case. And then they um, and then I meet with the child by themselves. And how do you ensure the child is by themselves? By themselves? Well, children are typically very honest. So if I say, is anybody else in the room with you or is your door closed or uh, can anybody else hear us? Or are we just, is it just you and I talking? They'll, they'll tell the truth. Okay. And so you interviewed them. And so I'm not going to go through every conversation, but um, eventually you interview third parties that aren't, that aren't part of this as well. Correct. Uh, sometimes. Okay. Did you inter interview Michelle Harrington? Not by herself. The times that I talked with Michelle were when she was on the phone with Jaden. Okay. And had you spoken to the grandmother, Teresa Ludwig, uh, during, and this is just your visitor report. Um, same thing. So the grandmother was at the home, at her home, when I viewed her home um, by Zoom. Um, let me see. Was that, I have to go back and look to see if that was during this, the visitor appointment in January, early January, and I was appointed as the GAL. And so yes, I, I viewed the grandmother's home while I was still appointed as the court visitor. The grandmother was present. Um, and even though I was trying to speak only with Jaden, the grandmother was inserting herself in the background. So, but I did not interview her one-on-one. -on -one. Okay. 
And when she made a comment, he said, inserting herself in the background, what was kind of going on? You know, she, she was just yelling comments about um, her home and why this was even an issue that she had, it, the home was perfectly um, fine to have Jaden there, that she had been involved in raising the other kids and um, things like that. She was, she was actually, um, my notes say that she was aggressive. Um, because I think, I think, you know, it was an emotional time. And so she was pretty aggressive yelling comments because she was, uh, she could overhear everything that I was asking Jaden. Okay. And um, so you have those interviews. Did you interview the father or the petitioners? Did you interview them more than once or just that one time? Just as the court visitor. Yes, I've interviewed both the petitioners and the father several times. Okay. And would you say it's an equal amount that you spoke to both the father and the petitioners? Um, I would say it's pretty equal. I may have spoke to the father more, a couple times more, but it's pretty equal. Okay. And you also said you downloaded some records or you got some records. Did you do that as part of this investigation as court visitor? Yes. And what did you end up getting? So that would have been, um, you know, all of the pleadings off of um, the court's file and looking at, and then I would have viewed the um, the watch reports, the disclosures for the petitioners, the certificates of trainings for the petitioners, just, you know, all of those qualifying um, documents. Um, so at any at that time, as the court visitor, it was everything that was on file through Odyssey. Um, and then anything that the either party would have sent me to view. Um, you can go to exhibit one and do you, re do you recognize what exhibit one is? Exhibit one is my initial CV report. Okay. Um, and if you go to page nine of your report, which is bait stamped 11, um, you list out father's attorney filed results from a UA performed on 112, which was positive for marijuana. Okay. Um, okay. So did you, at this point, so you had viewed the UA um, and it sounds like uh, he's told you about his employment up at the top. Did you review medical records for Jalen at this point? For Jalen, um, I, I am. I believe that um, petitioners had sent me some initial medical reports to view by then um, that had to do with um, uh, her uh, her immunizations or her and her um, the surgery that she had. So I don't, I did not attach those to my report and I don't always attach them if they've been filed separately with the court by one of the other parties. Okay. Um, but you had, you had reviewed everything that you were given. I, so I've reviewed, I reviewed everything that was sent to me by either party. Okay. And um, as part of that process as well, um, did you, now you went, okay, let me try this again. Now you went to the petitioner's home, but you didn't go to the father's home. Can you tell us why that is? I actually viewed both homes by Zoom. I oh, didn't physically go to either home. Okay, so they were both equal and they were both Zoom, both the same time. Right. I, I view every home by Zoom. I haven't, because of COVID, I have not uh, viewed any home in any case in person. And to the best of your knowledge, based on what is commonly done among GALs in the County of Cowlitz, is that a common practice for a GL to, to use the Zoom procedure these days? Yes. Okay. Um, Okay, so kind of getting into now, we know what you've done. Um, wanted to, so what conclusions, based on that initial investigation that you did, did you come to any conclusions after speaking to all of those people, after um, viewing the homes, and after pulling all the reports? Yes. So um, at, at that time, uh, as a CV, I recommended that the petitioners uh, be appointed as the emergency guardians at that time. Um, I did not believe that father had in the past or was currently uh, providing the statutory uh, parent parental functions under 2609-004. Okay. And what was the factual basis for, for those opinions? Uh, the factual basis? Um, so the 2609-004 goes down, uh, goes through what the parents uh, statutory uh, 
functions are supposed to be, which include providing uh, for uh, medical, and this is just off the top of my head, I, I without looking it up, but providing for medical care, uh, education, financial support, um, that they maintain a loving and stability, uh, a loving and stable relationship, that they nurture um, uh, interpersonal relationships, um, that they uh, provide adequate housing, clothing, food, those, those basic needs. Um, and my conclusion at that point was that the father had not provided for any of those things and um, that returning the child to him at that time would have been, uh, would not have been in the child's best interest and would have been detrimental for the child's well-being. So I had recommended that, that the emergency guardians uh, be appointed. Okay. Now you're talking about best interests. Um, is that based on the um, RCW 11 with regards to modification or termination of a guardianship the transition process? That is under, it's under 11, 131, 85, I believe. Um, let me see that. No, that's the basis for the appointment of uh, a permanent guardian, which is not what we were looking at at that time under, I think it might be under 225 was the, so, was the best interest. So there's two different standards. One, one is for, um, the 185 is for the appointment of the, the guardian for the minor and the 225 is for the appointment of the emergency guardian. And I'm, I'm just going to read you RTW 11-130-240 and 240. it says, 240, um, it says that uh, if termination of the guardianship would be harmful to the minor and it's the minor's interest in the continuation of the guardianship outweighs the interest of any other parent. Um, they're looking at, essentially, it's looking at a best interest test. Mm -hmm. So how long, when you did your, your now there was no guardianship in place, really, but when right. you did this study, um, how long had this child been in the care of uh, the petitioner by the time you first started investigating? Uh, over a year. So the child had been there over a year, and RCW 11 130.240 talks about the, essentially the trauma of and the harm from well, I'm going to object to counsel citing statutes and making an argument uh, for the witness to support. I mean, she can do that when we go to close the case, but that's it's inappropriate as part of a question. Well, I want to actually know, I'm only citing that because I want to know if that was part of your recommendation because she does pull statute in a recommendation. So well, I'm, fine, I'm fine with that. A lot of questions being addressed, no objections overruled. Okay. So is that, and I don't know if you knew the, the statute number, but is that kind of what you were, were looking at with this? Because you did mentioned best interest here. Um, it's in the child's best interest um, to remain in the petitioner's care. Um, right. So no, I didn't look at this particular statute because there wasn't a guardianship in place at that time other than the immediate uh, emergency order. Um, but as a court visitor or guardian at litem in general, we always look at the best interest of the child no matter what. Okay. And even though there was no proper guardianship in place, the children had been with these people for over a year, correct? She, the, yes, Jaylen had been with the petitioners for over a year at that point. And she had had no contact. Uh, she had minimal, if, uh, I guess, will you tell me how much contact had she had with her father? Uh, she had had no contact for an entire year. And then kind of moving on to the emergency part of it. Um, now, I know that's a two-part test. Do you, as a guardian ad litem or a court visitor, look at that test as well when you're giving recommendations? Yes. Okay. So in this case, did you find that the father was willing to provide for the, and I can actually pull it up real quick. I, I never remember the exact wording of it. Um, it's willing and able, and I believe it's under, I believe that's the one that's under the uh, 185. Yeah, uh, 225. 225. Um, yeah, so. The emergency authority, authority. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, no other person appears to have authority, ability, ability, or willingness to act to prevent substantial harm to the minor's health, safety, or welfare. Right. So, did you find um, that the father had authority? In this case, well, yes, he, well, he had authority, except that there was the immediate emergency order in place, giving the petitioner's authority temporarily. But had that not been in place, then the father would have had authority. What about the willingness? Did he have the willingness to uh, prevent substantial harm to the minor's health, safety, and welfare? So that's kind of a tricky question because he was objecting to the guardianship being put in place, which 
goes to his willingness. However, um, looking at what the circumstances are and him providing appropriate um, an appropriate environment then speaks to whether he's truly willing or not. Okay. And at that time, there was not a, an appropriate environment in place. It was the, so the willingness would be based on his objection to the guardianship only, as far as I was concerned. Okay. And through your investigation, did you find, did you make any determination or recommendations on his ability to act to prevent substantial harm to the minor's health, safety, or welfare? I did. And I did not believe at that time that he had the ability to provide or protect that child. And tell me what were some of the facts that, um, that underlied or that gave you uh, that basis to reach? Um, well, he didn't have um, a, appropriate housing in place. He was uh, at that time and still is living with his girlfriend who was providing housing for him. Um, and if he were to move in with his grandparents, which is what he says he was going to do, then they would be providing housing for him. So he would not be able to provide housing for that child on his own. He would be depending on other people to provide that. And the his history was that he was asked to leave several residents through different relatives um, over a period of time previous to all of this happening where he couldn't get along with these people or he wasn't complying with their rules and they asked him to leave. So that puts him in jeopardy of having unstable housing on his own. So if he couldn't provide for himself, my opinion is that he could not provide for her. That was just the housing. Okay. Um, Historically, had he made the, had the child been homeless with him at any point in the past? Let's see, he got her when she was three months. And I can ask it a different way. Was he kicked out of anybody else's house with the child when he had the child in his custody? Had he ever been kicked out of somebody's house? Well, well yes, the grandmothers. Her, um, these questions call for hearsay. I mean, I'm not sure how she knows he was kicked out or uh, somebody told her. Uh, it's in the yeah. report. report becomes evidence. Is the guardian ad litem report without an ER 904 doc? Uh, so the. I don't, I don't know if the supplemental was, but I believe it was. Um, the sealed report of the court visitor, the one we're talking about, was at ER 904 doc. The supplemental was not. The exhibit three was not, but exhibit one was. Does the exhibit one, does that address the issue of the homelessness question? Yes, it does. Okay. So just based on that, that factor, I'll over, overrule the objection. So... In your investigation, had you found that the father had been kicked out of any accommodation uh, where he was residing with the child? Yes. Okay. Um, and that what was it? That fear of homelessness. Um, did he? Did you find that the father had any stability in that he had a lease or he had anything where he could um, enforce his rights under the law with any of the housing he was? Objection. Leading. Sustained. Sustain, so rephrase. Yeah, I'm thinking about it and trying to. Um, had you found any evidence of any leases or any rental agreements that dad had? No. I'm leading, Your Honor. I think it's properly reframed, overruled. Okay. Um, did you um, did you find, I, I guess, instead of going that way, I, I won't lead you. I'll just say, in connection with your appointment and with meeting the father, uh, did you learn anything significant during your discussions with anybody? concerning the father, um, which you believe helped to frame your, your recommendation. Concerning the housing? Uh, concerning any issue. Well, yes, I learned um, many concerning things concerning all of the statutory parental uh, functions. Okay, so let's go through the court visitor part first. So what you learned about the housing, was that the only thing that came up in the court visitor area? Or is that, was there anything else that concerned you um, as your appointment as a court visitor? Um, no, there were other things that um, concerned me besides that he couldn't provide housing. Um, and what were some of those? Let me, that he didn't have steady employment, um, that he had tested positive for marijuana, that he had not been uh, paying, he had not contributed financially for Jalen's support while they, while she was in the care of the petitioners, um, that he had not participated in Jalen's medical care. Um, that he um, had very little time with her at the time I was appointed. He was just the, in the beginning phases of the of his uh, limited visits. 
Okay. And in your connection with your appointment, you also spent uh, got to speak to the child, correct? Yes. Okay. And how was the child's um, attachment or, or I guess, what was the child's overall um, health and safety like in the home of the petitioners? I had no concerns at all. Um, how many hours would you say you spent investigating and writing your court visitor report? Um, up to that point, I can tell you exactly how many hours. Um, let's see, January, up through um, the time that I wrote my report, there was uh, approximately 20 hours for the up through the time that I wrote my court visitor report. Okay. And at any point during that initial court visitor report, had Jaden ever disclosed to you that there was a registered sex offender um, living in the house of his girlfriend? No. Okay. Um, did, now he said first he lived at Reed's Fort, I think you said. Did he ever give you any other locations where he might be residing? His grandmother's in Toledo. Did he ever state to you that he was residing with his girlfriend, Michelle, in uh, Silver? Well, he did. And so because we initially made an appointment for me to view the Silverton home. Um, and then the morning of that um, appointment, he informed me that he would not be living there, that he would be only living in Toledo. And so we had to make another appointment so that I could view the Toledo home. Okay. So wait, so you had an appointment to view. So he calls you, I'm just trying to get this right. He calls you and tells you he lives with Michelle and that you're going to go see that home in Silverton. And you make the appointment and the morning of the appointment, he calls and says, "Never mind, I'm moving in with grandma. Is that right? Correct. Okay. And did he move in with grandma? Do you no. Know? Okay. And so were you ever allowed to view the home of Michelle Harrington? I have only seen Jaden's bedroom and the kitchen because there has been some short video visits between Jaden and I, where I've talked with him while he's been in that, in the bedroom or in transition to walking outside where I've seen the kitchen. Okay. Um, kind of moving on to your appointment as a, a GAL. Um, did you, uh, at what point did you learn that there was, and I can't remember his name now for the life of me. Um, at what point did you learn that Michelle Harrington's son resided in that house on James? Uh, I believe it was sometime just before the couple days we had of trial, which I, off the top of my head, I think was in May. So it was and, when we got close to those trial dates on the emergency. And did, was it Jaden that disclosed that information to you? No, I actually learned it from your office. And did Jaden ever inform you that anybody um, with a sex crime against a minor child was living in the home where he was residing. No. Um, I'm not object to the mischaracterization of where he's residing. And the objections noted that could possibly be addressed on cross. Um, if I can have you turn to Exhibit 31 for me. And it is a sex offender notification and photo. Did you ever speak with uh, this young man? No, I never spoke with him. Okay. And your honor, this has already been admitted um, into um, into the file, or sorry, into evidence as the ER 904. If I can have you slip to move to 32. Mm -hmm. Had you ever received any copy mm -hmm. of this pleading uh, during your investigation? I believe I received it from your office. But you never received any disclosure like this from Jaden or uh, her counsel agnostic? Not that I remember. Mm -mm. Um, if I can have you turn to exhibit 33, and I'm guessing the same thing that, um, that you were only disclosed this by my office. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, looking at this exhibit, had you known this at the time of your initial report? So I believe, um, this was disclosed after your initial visitor report came out. Would this have taken any sort of space up in that report? As in, would this have, um, become any any basis or would you have used this report um in any way or this pleading in any way essentially would it have helped you to form um, your recommendation i'm going to object that calls for speculation so i think so i i think uh, I, I take note of the objection i i think that uh, in gal work um you know whether something would have contributed or altered an opinion i think it's a fair question because i think they deal with a lot of different things so overall had i 
uh, reviewed these records, I would have them included them in my report. Okay. And so Liz, with um, Jaden Ludwig and Michelle Harrington uh, was found guilty of online sexual corruption, rape in the second and coercion. Um, and it appears that he went to prison. Um, and would, would you feel, would you feel that it would be safe for a child to um, be moved into the home of a third party non-blood related person with a guilty, um, guilty charges such as this? Absolutely not. Okay. And do you think, tell me what, if a parent wanted to do that and move their child into a home with a third party with these types of charges or convictions, tell me if that would, um, if that would cause you to question their ability to parent, if so, how? Well, I would absolutely question their judgment in being able to keep the child safe. The fact that this person lived in the home that the father was requesting to have unsupervised overnight visits, and, and he did request to have those visits in Silverton um, without ever disclosing that this person who has a sex offender conviction lived there is really concerning. To me, that says that he has does not have appropriate judgment on how to keep that child safe. Okay. And um, when... Uh, essentially after speaking to the father and speaking to others about the father, what impressions during your discussions with the father did you gain of him? Like what impression overall? In, in general. Um, in general, I think um, the father's um, has kind of a go with the flow attitude um, and will take things as they come, you know, not going to worry about it right now. So I, I don't think that he, uh, has the ability or insight into foreseeing what could potentially put that child in harm or or what sort of parenting needs to be in place, what skills need to be in place prior to parenting that child to be able to properly parent that child. I don't I don't think he is has insight into foreseeing ahead of time. He just goes in the moment. Okay. And did you ever speak to the father about his use of marijuana? His use of marijuana, yes. And what was the father's take on him smoking marijuana? It was, it was very casual. Okay. And did he uh, make any promises to stop? No. Okay. Um, did you express to him that you were concerned about it? I cannot specifically remember if I used the words concerned. I, I would have asked him, did he believe it inhibited his ability to make good judgments or parent the child? All right. Okay. Um, looking at the substance abuse evaluation, um, he states he has a zero history of substance use disorder. Um, he on occasion smokes marijuana, but never in the presence of Jalen. It doesn't interfere with his life. Um, it's disturbing. Ms. Forrest repeatedly stated she thinks I'm smoking around Jaden, Jalen with no basis. Um, I have done nothing to warrant this request. Um, do you think he has smoked around the child? And I, to be clear, I think, um, I think he was talking about cigarette smokes cigarette smoking at that point because uh that was one of my bigger concerns uh that i was um that was brought to my attention that he was smoking in the car smoking around the child um and where did you obtain the evidence of that that he was smoking around um, the child uh from the petitioners and did you talk to any third party or read any third party declaration based on smoking i have read um i have read a third party i believe i read a third party account from a person who witnessed um well, I'm smoking. Gonna this isn't... it's in the it's in the report and the witness is here today as well but i just wanted to you're saying i mean yeah sustained okay so um you were concerned around smoking with Jalen, um and marijuana um what did you um did you ever ask him to do a substance abuse evaluation? I didn't I, ask him personally to do one because that's my job is to make recommendations to the court. I, I don't, it's different in title 11 than it is in 26 In 11. We don't have the authority to ask someone to do, uh, to comply with that kind of a request. Okay. Would you, in this case, if you had the same ability you had in RCW 26, would you, um, would you recommend that he take or that Jaden do a substance abuse evaluation? I'm going to object to the second. Sustained. Sustained. 
would, given the history in this case, do you believe that a substance abuse evaluation would be informative for his use of marijuana and whether or not it impacts his ability to parent? I do. Okay. And uh, has he apparently has not taken that test. Um, has he ever mentioned to you that he would be willing to as long as somebody else paid for it? Yes. He wants the petitioners to pay for it. And when did you first hear about that? Um, honestly, I can't, I can't pinpoint a date, but I believe it was, um, I believe it was when we started having discussions about overnight visits. And um, he also mentions in his declaration a domestic violence evaluation. During your investigation, did you find that the father had or didn't have a history of domestic violence? I believe he does have. Okay. And uh, what? Sorry, I thought I, I thought there was an objection. I do believe he has a history of domestic violence. And what are the facts that give rise to that determination? Um, the situation with uh, that the detective or, uh, or police officer just testified to was one. Um, and then there was another issue, uh, another um, uh, incident that occurred with another person. And if I can have you go through exhibit 38, um, and it's based on 516. Mm -hmm. Is this the other one that you're talking about? The other? It is, yes. And given that you believe the father has a history of domestic violence, would you put any safeguards in place? And if so, what? Well, I think that he needs to be evaluated for domestic violence and then um, go to any classes or treatment that is suggested by the evaluator. Okay. Um, and you, you've you been in court um, on almost all the hearings, is that correct? I believe every hearing, yes. Have you ever seen dad get angry or behave in an inappropriate way during court? I've seen him um, with outbursts, yes. Okay. And is this one of the basis for um, obtaining that evaluation? Yes. I, 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 You know, that's not a domestic violence um, outburst, but it shows that he has some anger issues. And did you learn, um, uh, the father has submitted an online parenting certificate during your investigation of the father. Um, can you tell me what roles uh, the father did take on as a parent and what functions he didn't take on as a parent? They, let me try that again. Uh, during your investigation, um, can you tell me what he actively, what roles he actively took with regard to the child uh, while the child was in his care? What roles he actively took yeah, that's his, during his but visits? Did, did the father provide the normal parenting functions during the time he had visitation with the child? Um, I would say the majority of the time he has had visitation with the child, um, the parenting functions have been performed by other people during his visitation time. And what facts uh, give you give rise to that determination? Uh, in interviewing the petitioners and also um, Jaden and um, I can't recall for sure, but I think that the girlfriend had um, contributed to some of those conversations uh, that I had with Jaden about the visits. In your appointment as a GAL, not the court visitor, um, aside from the parties to this case, did you speak to anybody else? Um, well, Michelle Harrington is not a party, so I spoke with her. Um, let me see. And if you didn't speak to anyone, did you read declarations by any third parties concerning the subject matter? Um, I have read declarations from uh, every declaration that has been filed. Okay. And so we kind of went through the, the DV, your recommendations for that, the SUDS. Um, what type of living situation, because um, we talked about his, his housing situation, um, if you were to make a recommendation on um, the housing issue, um, can you tell us what that would be? Uh, well, that, that he would have um, uh, some sort of a lease so that, it, so that he wouldn't just lose his residence on a month to month. Um, that if, he, if there was a roommate, that that roommate would be vetted to be an appropriate person. Um, and anybody else that would be visiting that roommate in their home or some, some sort of um, safety measures that if there was concern about anybody. 
um, that he be able to afford to um, sustain that residency in the event that a roommate moved out or that he was the sole leasee. And um, at this time, so you've looked at his history and you've looked at where he is now and he is seeking to terminate um, this minor guardianship or this petition. Um, has the father done anything um, during this case that you believe kind of breaks up the history from what his future is going to be? It's that whole idea, like I said, is our, our past actions kind of tell us who we are going to be in the future unless there's something to intervene. Have you found any action the father has taken that's been proactive that's really assisted him in kind of uh, becoming a better parent? So um, the father has taken some steps for towards improvement. Um, I think the majority of what those steps are have been to go through the motion and not to actually learn the skills of properly parenting and providing. Um, he has not uh, gone through the steps that is needed to take, that he needs to take to obtain housing. Um, and, you know, the reality is that if he, he says that he's going to have housing in Toledo, but work in Silverton, that's a five hour round trip for him to travel every day plus the time that he's working, that he'll be away from the child. So he would be away from the child, you know, 13, 13 plus hours per day. Um, that doesn't, that doesn't seem like it makes sense to me. So he either has to, he either should have housing near his employment or vice versa, get a job near the housing. Um, he hasn't taken those steps. Um, he hasn't taken steps into looking into uh, proper preschooling. That's, you know, right now the child is in a preschool. He hasn't and she's and she's receiving individualized um, uh, curriculum based on her needs. Um, as I am not aware that the father has taken any steps to provide um, appropriate education or daycare or preschool for that child. Um, but he hasn't been involved in her medical care. Um, he has neglected her medical care. I am not aware that he even knows who the doctor is or has obtained medical records or has even taken steps to inquire into what her medical needs are at this point. I know that when she had surgery, um, it was offered to him, the information was offered to him and he did not care enough to even uh, hear the information. Um, and um, you said that you, he, he hasn't gotten any of the medical um, information. Has he been updating himself on any, to the best of your knowledge, has he requested um, to be involved in decision-making with the medical treatment of this child? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. The, and, other, the other step that I, that I wanted to finish okay. talking about too was financial. He hasn't contributed financially towards the child's care in any form uh, while she's been in the petitioner's care. And, but he has had, a, he informed you that he was working for Forest River, correct? Yes. Um, and did he inform you of how much he was making per hour? Um, he did. I can tell you what he told me. Um, $16 an hour, 40 hours a week, uh, $27.52 gross. So once he started getting visitation with the child, did you, have you, uh, were you able to view that him actually with the child and interacting with the child? I have not done in-person visits, no. Oh, I mean over Zoom. So him with the child over, over Zoom? Um, no. Okay. Um, have you spoken to the child alone? I have. Okay. And uh, when you spoke to the child alone, um, did you, were you able to, and we won't go into child hearsay, but did it give you pause or give you concern for any, any issues that you might need to do additional investigation on? And if so, what? Well, there, it, there was the um, information I received about um, the child being in, uh, at Michelle Harrington's home and that I needed to do into, uh, additional I'm investigation. Object, Your Honor, this is child hearsay that, uh, is inadmissible. Yeah, I, th I think your answer, um, has moved around that and didn't cite that. It just indicated that, that she had concerns based on the conversation, with the child, that, that uh, there was needed additional observation. So noted overruled. Okay. And any, anything else that you, uh, are concerned about in this case, um, from any, any person that you spoke to um, that you would like to see addressed in some way in a court order or that you feel would be necessary to protect the child? Well, I think, I think um, you know, personally, I think that um, 
that a mental health evaluation is uh, not unreasonable to request um, to determine whether the uh, father is um, has the ability to make good judgment calls to protect the child and care for her. Okay, and um, I'm just going to have you turn to one page, and, and then I'll pretty much be done. Uh, before we do that, though, in this case, what would be your recommendation as far as whether or not this guardianship should be granted? I, I believe at this time the guardianship should be granted um, with recommendations in place for the father to go forward, get evaluations, um, uh, obtain more skills, obtain appropriate um, residential um, accommodations where the child can have overnights, um, you know, and work towards the reunification. But uh, at this time, uh, I believe that the guardian should, should be granted and petitioners um, are fit and qualified and should be appointed as the child's guardians. During your investigation, did you discover at any time that the petitioners were um, using abusive use of conflict or were trying to keep father out of the lives or were essentially trying to form a wedge between them? Did you find any evidence of that? No, just the opposite. They are, they are fully supportive of father taking the steps that he needs to take to uh, be able to parent this child. Okay. And then finally, my last, my last thing, I'm going to have you look at exhibit 25 and on exhibit 25, I'm going to have you look at, um, Request number one is admit that you spend more than five overnights per week as defined by hours midnight to 4 a.m. in a residence that is not located in Toledo, Oregon. And he responded, deny. My grandparents, this is at Exhibit 26, my grandparents live at 1 Toledo. I will be spending every night there once I have custody of Jalen. Um, were these the kinds of answers you were getting when you requested information about where he lived? Yeah, the um, so he gave me a lot of um, answers that told me what he would do if he was if the child was returned to him, but he did not tell me the steps he was taking to put those things in place before the child would be returned to him. So he's only willing to go to those efforts if he gets the child back. Did he ever tell you why he didn't move there? Or why he didn't move to Grandma's house right now? If if he was, did he ever give a reason to you? The, the distance that he would have to drive to and from work. Okay. And I'll have you look at exhibit 13. Mm -hmm. These are the interrogatories um, that we requested. And if you go to 133, he lists his address as street. But then if you go to 134, uh, he mentions it again. Um, but he says, on a temporary basis, until I obtain custody, I stay with Michelle Harrington. And then we'll be residing with my grandmother, but he's been temporarily residing with her for the last five months so that I can maintain residential time with my daughter. Um, did you know that he had been, did he ever share with you how long he had been residing with Michelle Harrington? Um, uh, all my notes just say temporary. I don't, I don't have any dates. Okay. Um, if somebody had told you that they had five months at a, a residence, uh, would that warrant for you further investigation of the people that live there? Oh, sure. Okay. And finally, now, you know, just kind of moving on, um, after considering everything that you mentioned in your testimony today, everything that's in your reports, um, do you have an opinion about the father's capacity to care for um, th the three-year-old Jalen? Well, um... I, I think that he ha needs to have a mental evaluation to determine the capacity. But as far as his um, ability to uh, perform the statutory parental functions, no. The the only one out of all of those um, functions is uh, the loving relationship. Um, he's not. He has not shown that he is able to parent that child under any of those other requirements. Okay. And based on the interviews and investigations that you've had, can you tell us what you would believe the custody, um, obviously dad's visitation, what that would look like? If you could give a recommendation on what a custody framework would look like if the guardians were the petitioners and he had custody, um, what would you want to see in that custody order? So I think, um, you know, I think that he needs to have visits along with the child. I think that he needs to, um, learn how to take care of that child by himself. He he brings other people with him on almost all the visits. He has told me that uh, he 
he he wrote me an email saying that he has had some visits with her alone, but then I hear from uh, the other parties that that's not true. So he, I don't know that he's been truthful to, with me. Um, uh, so as far as visits go, I don't think that he's ready even for overnight visits yet. I think that he needs to prove that he can take care of that child during the day on the short visits. Right now, he has every weekend. He does not exercise every weekend. And in fact, he's not going to exercise this three-day weekend coming up. He's not going to exercise the time in the middle of September. Um, but yet he expects that because the court has ordered every weekend that the petitioners have given up all of their weekend times so that because to be available to transfer that child to him for his day visits. So I don't think that that um, should stay in place. I think maybe it should be moved to every other weekend. Um, and until he can show that he can take care of that child independently um, and do some parenting classes and have some evaluations, um, the DV treatment or anger management treatment, whichever one is deemed by the evaluator to be appropriate, I don't think he should have overnight visits. One of the things that concerns me is that he consistently has asked the court to allow him to have overnight visits and have that child travel a six hour round trip to the grandmother's house for those visits. But yet he hasn't moved to the grandmother's house where he would have to travel to come see the child. I, I think that that's concerning. I think it's even more concerning that everything is based on what if. I'm only going to do these things if I get my child back. All right. Um, I have no further questions. Uh, for the continue or for the start of the cross examination of Ms. Farr. I am. Great. We'll turn the time to you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Farr, your uh, initial report uh, indicated that you were the court visitor. Correct. Okay. Uh, and then uh, I'm looking at the, the second report, basically had the same indication on it. But uh, were you a court visitor for the second report? Um, I was the guardian at litem by the second report. Okay. So the heading on the second report, I'm looking at uh, page mm -hmm. 40. Um, this would be exhibit uh, two or three, exhibit three, where it says supplemental report of court visitor. That's not correct. You were a guardian at litem. That's correct. That's a typo. Okay. Um, and what's the difference between a court visitor and a guardian at litem? So the, there is a big difference. The court visitor is appointed usually to um, investigate whether a parent can be found to be served um, because the, the petitioners at that point would have uh, had difficulty serving one of the parents. Um, and then the court visitor um, goes through and, and just kind of checks to see that all the appropriate documents have been filed, like the disclosures, the watch reports, those things, are, everything's all in order, um, and then files a report to say, you know, what those, what the uh, general overall situation is, and if those things have all been done, and what needs to be done, or you know how the court visitor can assist in getting those things done. And when the guardian ad litem is appointed, it means that there's specific um, issues that have to be investigated that go deeper into um, something like domestic violence or sexual abuse or um, other issues that um, that relate to where that child should be placed or whether visitation should be put in place or things like that. Okay. Um, are, you, are you an advocate for the petitioners in this case? No. You're not an advocate for them? Okay. Not for the petitioners, no. I act in the best interest of the child. Okay. Um, in your report on uh, page six, you indicate that the petitioners believe that Jaden is not identified on the father or as the father on Jalen's birth certificate. That was an issue. Yeah, that was an, an issue that I identified that needed to be addressed. Okay, and that's been resolved. Correct. The petitioners mm -hmm. were able to obtain the birth certificate and file it, and Jaden was listed as the father. Okay, uh, and then on the next page, on page seven, uh, on paragraph two, you say Jaden assaulted the petitioners. And so, Mr. Anakmasu, are you referring to the CV report or the supplemental report? The the court visitor report. Okay. So, so this is zero seven. Um, this is exhibit uh, one. Exhibit one of your? No, Miss um, Winkles. Miss Winkles, okay, let me, let me find that. Uh, and paragraph two, Jaden assaulted petitioner Kelly Crick. Mm -hmm. You made that finding. No, it's not, that's not a finding. That is a, a summary of what has been reported to me. That's a summary. Uh, isn't it true that Jaden told you that he hadn't assaulted her? 
Um, Jaden told me um, at that point. So Jaden, Jaden may have told me he didn't assault her, but the police reports indicated differently. So I reported what I believe to be the truth on the information I had reviewed. Okay. So uh, basically you took the police reports and said, this is the truth. Uh, and therefore he assaulted Kelly Craig. Yes. Okay. Along and with, along with what the petitioners also um, confirmed that, that what was in the, what their version was, what matched what the police report said. Uh, even though there were in the police reports, there was uh, both his statement and Teresa Ludwig's statement. So they, the police took statements from everybody and then they made their own report. And that I went off of what the police officer's report was. Okay. Uh, and you did not present uh, Mr. Ludwig's, Jaden's uh, side of this where, uh, I mean, you could have said it's alleged that he assaulted her or anything along those lines. You just said he assaulted her. You made a finding. Well, um, the way I write my summaries is, uh, so nowhere in my report do I make findings. I have opinions and I have summaries and I report what other people tell me. Um, I, I don't make findings per se. It's it's then it's your opinion that he assaulted uh, Kelly Craig. It is my opinion after reviewing all the documents that that is what happened. And that would have included, um, you know, the versions that father told me to. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, father has told me a couple different things. And and so I those. What he has told me. Um, I also believe. Uh, based on what he told me, that the police reports are accurate. Based on what he told you, you believe that you're aware that these charges were dropped. Well, yeah, but that has nothing to do with the actual assault happening. I, I didn't say he was convicted or charged. Okay, but <laughs> you convicted him and charged him. And basically, he said he committed assault, and therefore uh, he needs, uh, you know, a psych eval and. Um, uh, domestic violence uh, evaluation. When I see a pattern of anger or uh, domestic violence incidences, then I nine times out of 10 recommend evaluations or treatments. Uh, and and the, the pattern you're talking about, is it this one incident or what's the pattern? The pattern being that incident, the, the incident with uh, Rebecca Santos, and then the outburst that I have personally viewed. Okay. Um, See, let's go to Rebecca Santos. I forget the number of that. Uh, and uh, so uh, part of your rationale is based on this domestic violence uh, petition. Is that correct? It, it, it's a component, correct. Okay. Um, and how did you obtain this? Was this given to you by uh, the petitioner's counsel? I believe so. Okay. So petitioner's counsel found this and gave it to you. Uh, and based on that, you're now recommending that uh, uh, Jaden have to go through a domestic violence evaluation um, with input from your clients and, and, and any recommended treatment. More weight was given to the incident with Miss Crape and the outburst I have witnessed right. myself. Okay, but some weight is given to this, right? Mm -hmm. Some, yes. Okay, um, <clears throat> back to your report, um, because you, you put it in your report, uh, my client's birthday mm -hmm. on page two, You see his birthday? I'm looking. It, your client's birthday? My client's birthday. Let's see. Okay. 517. And the birthday of the Jaden E. Ludwig of this um, petition. Do you see what that is? Back on page 516. 516. Let me go back to that. 520.03. 520.03. Three. Three years after my client was born, somebody with the name Jaden E. Ludwig uh, was involved in some uh, domestic issue. This isn't my client. Are you aware of that? No, I wasn't. Okay. And do you know his middle initials? Um, They're like two letters, AJ or JA or something like that. Yeah, I don't I don't recall the middle initials. But, but, um, but if I told you it's not E, would that surprise you? Um, well, it wouldn't surprise me because, you know, mistakes, are, mistakes can be made. Either that's a typo on the birth date or it was not him. Um, and people do make mistakes. Okay. Um, he's going to say that is not him. He has no idea who 
uh, Rebecca Santos is, and he was not born in 2003, he was born in 2000. Okay. Um, but my point is, at least part of your recommendation is based on this document that was supplied to you by uh, the petitioners. And even without that document, I would still make the same recommendation. So, so even without that, it, it doesn't yes. matter. Uh, if he's if taking that one document out of it, out of it, I would still re make the recommendation based on what happened between him and Miss Crape, and based on the outbursts I have witnessed. Uh, even though what happened between him and Miss Crape, um, the the criminal charges were were dismissed. Yeah, even though there, even though there weren't, uh, even though they didn't go forward, yes, okay. there was still a restraining order put in place for a year. Okay, in your um, um, report. Um, on page eight, uh, you indicate that my client has not filed an objection to the standard petition for guardianship. Is that a factor? Well, it is. Um, so before I answer, on page eight of my report or the bait stamp eight? Bait stamp eight, bait I stamp. apologize, page six. Okay, so this is part of the summary. And in my summaries, I usually outline what has and hasn't occurred, like I was saying, um, uh, as to procedural issues. So that, that is a procedural issue that was something that I thought should be mentioned. Okay. And ultimately it was determined that he is on the birth certificate. Yes. Okay. Um, isn't it true my client has asked on several occasions uh, that he be allowed to have overnight visits with his daughter? He has asked, he has made that request several times, yes. Okay. Uh, and the uh, petitioners uh, have, have indicated, yeah, you know, we don't have a problem with him having an overnight, but it's it's Miss Farr who says he shouldn't have an overnight. I I think that that is mischaracterized. Okay. I, I don't think that's exactly what was said. Okay. Uh, you've been at all the hearings on this matter, right? I, I think I have, yes. Okay. So the hearing on uh, May 5th, 2013, we actually kind of started a emergency guardianship trial. We were taking testimony from witnesses. You recall mm -hmm. that? Mm-hmm. Okay. You said May 5th? May 5th. Okay. I thought maybe I would have the clerk's minutes, but I don't see them. Okay. All right. Um, and uh, it, you agree that uh, if my client would have contacted Kelly uh, Crape um, before October of last year, uh, they believe that the restraining order was in effect and he would go to jail. Where do you see that? I, I don't see it. I'm asking you a question. Okay. okay. I'm sorry. Can you can you ask me that again? This is the question. Mm -hmm. um, there was a restraining order in place for a year. Yes. And during that year, if my client would have uh, attempted to contact um, his, his daughter, uh, he potentially would have went to jail. That's not correct. That's not correct. No. So uh, Jay Lynn goes to daycare where Kelly Craig works. Is that correct? Yes, where she did work. She doesn't work there anymore. Okay. So had he contacted Jay Lynn at daycare where Kelly Crape works, uh, she would have called the police and he would have been arrested. I I can't say what she would have done uh, had that occurred. All right. But well, he had he had opportunity to contact other people aside from Kelly to have visits with Jay Lynn, and he chose not to exercise that. Okay. Um Ms. Crape said that during the May 5th hearing that uh, this was my question. Anytime until October, if he would have contacted you, you thought the restraining order was in effect, you would have reported the police. Her answer, yep. And he would have contacted her, yes. Yeah. And when he did contact you, you did report that to the police, yes. But he could have contacted other people to get visits with the child. Okay. All right. Um, the child was not and, on the restraining order. And then... When the, he did find out that the restraining order was lifted and he informed uh, the Ludwigs or uh, the petitioners that he was going to come up and get Jay okay. Lynn, they did call the police. That's okay. true. Yeah. Okay. In your report on, on page, bait page uh, number nine, uh, you indicate Jaden told me he did not intend to have Jay Lynn at that home, talking about uh, Michelle Harrington's home. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, that's what he told you, right? This was your first report. And he's telling Correct. you, 
He did not intend to have Jaylen at uh, Michelle Harrington's home, correct? Right. Okay. That that was uh, he told me that on the day that we had the Zoom for me to view the Silverton home. That's what that's referring to. Is he told me that morning at the beginning of the Zoom, I don't intend to have her here, so you need to do the walkthrough with me at my grandmother's. But up to that point, he had not told me. You didn't say that in your report, though. Well, that is what my report says. It says, Jaylen, then uh, it says, I arranged to view the Silverton home via Zoom. However, during that appointment, Jaden then told me he did not intend to have Jalen at that home. Um, so I think it's clear it was during that Zoom appointment, he told me. That, that's your testimony. That's what it says. Yes. And that is my testimony. Okay. All right. Um, you ob objected to having overnights at Teresa Ludwig's house in Toledo because you said it was a 189 mile drive. I don't remember if it was 189, but yes, it, something. Oh yeah. I have that right there. 189. Yes. Right. That was part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you know, the fact that he lives in central Oregon and his parents live here in Silverton and have Jaylen driving to have a relationship with his daughter um is outweighed by the distance that he has to drive the three hour drive is that my understanding yeah he, he yes he could make other arrangements to have overnights that do not involve his grandparents at a three hour one way trip I, I guess my question is what's wrong with a three hour one way trip uh with, with your child uh if your child and the father are together so it's, it's a three year old child you're asking for her to endure a six hour round trip every every weekend when the father was not willing to endure a two and a half hour trip to go prepare himself to at that residence and show that he could have a proper residence there with the child. That's the, that's the logic. Okay. Uh, so the, the lot, your logic is 189 mile trip on a weekend outweighs a constitutional right for him to have a relationship with his daughter. That's not what I said. Okay. All right. Um, you, you did view the Toledo home. This is on the top of page 10, uh, which was tidy inside, including the room where Jalen. So he provided all the information where Jalen would uh, be staying. I think they provided pictures to you of her, where her bed would be and, and, and those type of things. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, you indicate that the grandmother asked him to leave uh, two years ago regarding house rules. Correct. Is that something that uh, Teresa Ludwig told you? No, that's something that uh, petitioners told me and Jaden confirmed. Okay, the petitioners told you that. Okay. Now, at, at this time, uh, do you know if uh, your initial report, if Jaden was working for the, the employer that he has now? Uh, no, I don't. I think that uh, he was working for. I'd have to go back through here, but I think uh, from memory, I think he was working at the pizza place when I wrote this report. Okay. Uh, and he's now working for a tire company, my understanding, or a, a, tra a trailer company. Trailer. Uh, his company. duties include uh, include something with tires. Right. Uh, and he's been at that employment for many months. Uh, I think five or six months. Okay. Uh, you have indicated that uh, he uh, has missed some of his visits with uh, Jay Lan over this period of time. Yes. Okay. Uh, and uh, isn't it true that uh, Kelly Crape has canceled some of the appointments, uh, his visits? When the child was sick or or Jaden didn't show up on time, yes. Okay. Uh, you're not aware that she recently canceled because she had a, a daycare uh, event going on on the weekend and wanted Jay Lan to attend? No, I'm not aware of that. Okay. And Jay Lynn is no longer in diapers. Correct. Right. Uh, and um, uh, there's been allegations that my client doesn't feed her. So he has taken pictures of on visits of feeding her. Did you get those? He has sent me pictures of uh, plates of food in either restaurant settings or I think a couple were in a uh, on a blanket, like in a uh, picnic setting. And you have not seen. Uh, my client uh, with Jay Lynn uh, personally? Not in person, no. And I typically do not. And have you talked to people where they describe uh, his relationship with his daughter? 
Um, yes. Uh, isn't it true they uh, described a, a very close, uh, loving, bonded relationship? What's been described to me is that she is excited to see him, that she loves him, and vice versa. Okay. Now, after the, the restraining order, so, so now I'm, I've gone on to your, your next report, which is bait stamp 40, uh, yeah. your supplemental report. And it, it indicates court visitor, but at this time you were a, a guardian, a guardian ad litem, that is. So the caption says court visitor, but then the first paragraph says I was appointed as the guardian ad litem um, right, and, then, and gives my appointment dates uh, of both. It's just the caption just has that typo. Right. And at this point, your duty is to make a recommendation to the court uh, regarding uh, going forward. This was, yes. Okay. I believe this this report was specifically for um, visitation. Now, in this report on page um, 46, base stamp 46, um, you allege that Jay Lynn has been to Michelle Harrington's house in Silverton. Or not uh, in yes, sort of Oregon. I, I, I say that uh, a concern was reported to me that the child had been to that home. Yes. Right. Uh, and are you aware that the the petitioners then use that uh, allegation in court, uh, basically saying, you know, straightforward that my client has taken Jalen to Silverton to Michelle Harrington's house where her son uh, resides. That is what is believed. Yes. Okay. That's what believed. And are, are you aware that uh, counsel for the, the petitioners have gotten all the Google uh, tracking stuff off of your phone that apparently Google keeps track of now? Yes, it's part of the exhibits. Um, and uh, you're aware that that has never happened? I do not believe that that shows it did not happen. I think that there are some instances on the, in that Google search that show that it could have happened. Could have. So basically, well, we, we see the location. We don't we don't know for sure. I mean, I can't tell for sure. All right. And specifically on the top of page 47, uh, this visit would have taken place on Sunday, May 28, 2023. That's what was reported to me initially, That's yes. Uh, the petitioners. Okay. Uh, and uh, there has been no substantiation of that by the petitioners. You're aware of that? I, do, I don't think that we have, you know, solid proof. No. Okay. Uh, my client gave them the Google tracking devices from for all that period of time. They haven't submitted any of that. Is that correct? Um, I, I don't know. I can't answer that question. The uh, the, the petitioners say things like um, the child is returned hungry uh, and um, uh, uh, basically you accept those statements and not my client's statements that he feeds her or the pictures that he's taken of her eating. Is, is that I, my understanding? I believe I reported both. I reported what they told me. I reported what, the, what he told me. Okay. Yeah, uh, and it's right there in that par the next paragraph there on the same page describes what father what father told me. So I've reported both. Is it important for parents to have overnights with their children? I, I don't know that there is, um, I think that it's important for parents to have visits with their children. I don't know that it's specifically important for overnights. Okay. So putting a child to bed and being there when they wake up in the morning, um, you don't think that's an important part of parenting functions? Oh, so yes, I do think that that is an important part of parenting functions, yeah. but I also think that the child's well-being has to outweigh that. Right. And are you aware that the petitioners have said <laughs> that uh, it doesn't matter? She's sleeping. So why does it matter where she's sleeping? She can sleep at our house just as easily as his. Do you, do you are aware that the petitioners have that attitude? I don't think they have that attitude. Uh, I don't recall that. Okay, there's a declaration from Kai Ludwig that says exactly that, that because Jalen will be sleeping, that doesn't matter that he have overnights. I, I don't recall that, so I'd have to read it. Right. Um, 
but you don't agree with that. I don't agree with what? That it's not important to have children to put them to bed and be there when they uh, wake up potentially in the middle of the night or wake up in the morning. I do think that it's important for uh, a parent to perform those evening and morning functions and to keep the child safe during the, the night. Uh, you know, they, children wake up with nightmares or whatever goes on. It's important for the parent to be able to attend to the child. But I also think that it's important that that parent is in a position where they, they have proved that they've already been able to meet the child's needs during the day before it moves to night. And it's your position that my client uh, has not proven that he can do that. That is my position. Okay. So even though is that true? I mean, he feeds her. He you know clothes you know keeps her in clean clothes and and um, uh, exercises his visitation as much as he can without having any overnights. I don't think those three things you just mentioned have been um, have had a uh, strong enough pattern that he has the ability to, to do those to uh, the level that that child requires. I think that he has made attempts, but I don't think he's quite there yet. Okay. Uh, my client has told you his plan regarding Jaylen. is that correct? If he were to get custody? Correct. Yes. And his... His plan and, and what he's told you and uh, what he's provided for you is that Jalen and he will be living in Toledo, Oregon. That's what he's told me. Okay. Uh, and um, he goes to work. He goes to work relatively early. Be aware of that. Uh, his hours, I think, were 730. I remember right. Uh, oh, yeah. 7 to 330. Right. 7 to 330. Okay. So he would, if he's, it's an hour and a half. And, and, uh, you have repeatedly said it's more than two hours or something from uh, Toledo to Silverton where his job is, but it's, it's only 90 miles and it's an hour and a half roughly. Um, I, well, I don't think that's true, but I, I can, can look that up real quick. So it is two hours. Uh, according to Google maps, it is a two hour drive one way. According to Google map, but how many miles is it is? It because is 94.2 miles. 94 miles. Uh, and he says, yeah, it takes an hour and a half. Um, and uh, uh, so um, he, he would leave to get to work uh, in the morning. And then he gets off at, like you said, 3.30 and he would be home by five o'clock. Well, I don't know that that is accurate. That would be as long as everything went perfect. And that, but, you know, uh, I mean, there's no way for me to know that for sure. Okay. But if, but if that was true, you know, that's still, he wouldn't be there in the morning to get her up, do the morning duties, get her off to daycare or school, or he wouldn't now, he would barely be there in home at home to even get her ready for bed. So, so Kai Ludwig is not doing any of that. Is that correct? Hi. Yes. Um, I, I believe that the family works. I believe that the couple works together. Okay. Uh, so if. And, and you're aware that he found a daycare. Uh, I think it's um, a Head Start just down the street from where his grandmother lives. And that's where uh, Jaylen would be enrolled. He has not provided me any information about daycare. All right. Um, okay. Uh, you didn't ask him if he had found daycare for? Her? I have asked several times if he has found a doctor, if he's found daycare, uh, if he's looked for a job closer to Toledo. I've, I've asked all those questions. He hasn't provided me any of that information. Um, you've looked at his work history, is that correct? I know what his work history is since this uh, these proceedings began. And I know that he was, um, I don't know the specifics before these proceedings, but I know that he has not had a steady job before that. Okay. But he has one now. For the last five, six months is the only steadiness he's had. Yes. Okay. Uh, and he's, he's very young. He is. Okay. Uh, and uh, so um, you disagree with his plan uh, for uh, Jaylen to go to daycare while he works and then he's home by five o'clock. I do not disagree with him putting her in daycare. Okay. Um, yeah, but like I said, he hasn't shared with me any of that information. All right. And... 
you agree that he can't enroll her in daycare until he has custody of her. That is, that's true. That doesn't mean that he can't couldn't um, you know vet the daycare right. facilities and see what the uh, what they provide because she's not in daycare right now. She's in preschool. It's a it's a pretty big difference. Uh, head starts preschool, isn't it? Um, not the, the not to the level that she's receiving. Okay. Um, and then the, the same issues regarding uh, medical care. Uh, he has physicians that are you know ready and available in Toledo for uh, Jaylen, but he doesn't have custody. He hasn't provided me any information to even verify. The do you agree that? Uh, having tubes put in a child's ear is kind of a routine thing. Maybe. Your Honor, I'm going to object. Um, he's asking essentially expert testimony from the lay witness. Objections noted. I'll, I'll allow him to explore it, and you can renew. I was going to say that I, I know it's common, but I'm not a medical okay. professional, so I can't answer that. It's common. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, if my client resided in Toledo uh, with his grandmother. Uh, would he have overnight visits at this time? Would that be a recommendation? My recommendation for overnight visits is not based on where he's living alone. It's based on the combination of um, of what parental functions he has shown a pattern to perform. If he was living in Toledo right now, I would still recommend that if he did have overnights that they occurred near the child's residence, not in Toledo. But, but that's where his residence would be. That's, I mean, that's where he's saying his residence is. But I think the father should do the traveling for the overnight, not the child. I, I father could do the traveling from Toledo to um, Silver Lake and have, an, and have an overnight there, the same as he could if he was in Silverton and traveling to Silver Lake. It's there's no difference. My recommendation as to where he's residing that he hasn't actually set up a residence yet has to do with the guardianship, not so much the visitations. Okay. Well, isn't it true that uh, he has brought several motions asking for overnights and you have objected to overnights? Even I have. Here. I Even. have objected every time. Yes. Okay. And you're aware that um, the petitioners, uh, strike that, not the petitioners, but uh, Kai, petitioner Kai Ludwig lived at this same house with both my client and his sister when they were younger. I have been told that. I don't know the condition of the house when that occurred compared to what it is now. Okay. Well, you saw pictures of, um, my clients provided pictures. Was there anything inappropriate in the pictures that where she'd be sleeping in the bedroom, the same bedroom that uh, Kai Ludwig had uh, put them in years ago? Well, I don't know if that's where they, if that's was the condition of the house years ago. I, I have nothing to compare that to. What I do know is the Zoom walkthrough I did with um, Jaden, the outside of the house was full of junk and not safe for a, for a three year old. Are, did you do a Zoom of the petitioner's house? Yes. Are you aware that they have dogs that have harmed Jay Lynn during this process? I am aware that they have four dogs. They, I am not aware of any harm. So my client hasn't told you of Jay Lynn having scratches and things caused by the dogs? I don't think scratches are would fall into the harm category. Maybe a bite would, not a scratch. He doesn't uh, smoke marijuana around Jay Lynn. Is that true? I have no way to know that, okay. whether he does or doesn't. All right. He has said that he doesn't. Is that correct? I don't believe he's ever denied that to me. Okay. He's. I, I don't recall him telling me specifically that he does not. All right. Uh, and what about cigarettes? Has he said he does not smoke cigarettes around Jay Lynn? Um, he does smoke cigarettes when he has Jalen. Um, he had to be told by the court that he was not allowed to smoke around her uh, before he stopped. When was that? 
I would have to look back through the court minutes, but it was when Commissioner Nelson was here, Commissioner Nelson specifically told him he could not smoke around her. And you believe that he was smoking around here before Commissioner Nelson told him? He was. <laughs> so you say that he admitted it? Is that what yes. You're saying? Okay. All right. Now, I, I guess there's a difference between uh, smoking with a child in a car and smoking when you're in a park and a child's off somewhere else playing. Is that what we're talking about? The, are you saying that he smoked in the car with Jalen uh, while they were driving? I actually cannot remember if that, I would have to look back through my notes and, and the court minutes to see. I don't remember specifically if that was uh, okay. ever determined. I do know that he um, was smoking in the car while Jay Lynn was off with Michelle. And then Jay Lynn would come back and get in that car that had been smoked in. Well, okay. Uh, I don't think I have anything further on. Okay, uh, we'll turn to Ms. Winkles for a redirect. Yes, just a brief uh, redirect. Um, as an investigator for the court, um, is it your duty to investigate and speak to people and come up with what is more reasonably, more likely than not true? Yes. Or, okay. Is it your duty to discover without any doubt whether or not an allegation is absolutely correct? No. I'm not a fact finder. Okay. And um, the uh, the questions, the typos, um, misspelling of names, um, my uh, my potential um, issue with with sending you um, something that may have not been right. Um, these small things do they change the substantive nature of your report to this court? Specifically, talking about that DV report, and that's what I had previously said that even if even if that report was not, uh, did not involve Jaden, I would still be recommending DV evaluation and treatment. And did, were you aware that Jaden Ludwig lived in Spokane at the time of that report? That the time of that DV, um, that DV petition? Oh, um, what was the, I have to see what the date on that was. Um, and then I can answer that. Let's see. I'll, I'll strike it. But in any event, if, if it is incorrect, and it, it may very well be, um, knowing that now that it could possibly be incorrect, are you still uh, requesting or still, uh, is it still your request to have DV evaluation and treatment? Yes, it doesn't change my recommendation. Okay. And um, the other thing is the dad has mentioned, uh, sorry, the, they've mentioned, um, did you know this? Did you know this? Did you know that? Um, whose job is it to supply personal details about the parties? Is it yours to go out and investigate whether or not dad has A, B, and C, or is it dad's job to disclose to you? It, it is the party's, um, it is the party's duty. And I make it very clear with them when I, when I initially, and, and usually almost every interview I have with them, I say, if anything changes, if you have any updates, if you have any concerns, make sure you get in touch with me. It is the, the duty of any party to contact me. I, I don't have a magic button or a wand to wave to know that there's something going on unless they contact me. Okay. And is it fair to say that dad pretty much didn't start really contacting you a lot until um, around May? That's true. And can I have you go to exhibit three with bait stamped 54? And do you recognize what this is? I do. And what is it? It is an email that was sent to me by Mr. Anagnostu's office uh, in error. Okay. And can you read it out loud to court? It says, Jaden. I'm going to object. Sure. Um, I mean, they admit that it's from my office to my client, attorney client privilege. Ms. Winkles? Yes. Well, when you, uh, when you inadvertently disclose a document, you have a certain time period in order to rescind that document. You have to, number one, give notice. There's an actual statute. Uh, there's, a, there's a rule on it. So you have to give notice. Um, if that notice is objected to, you obviously go to court on a motion to rescind. The other thing is, is this was probably disclosed in this binder. It's been here. Um, the ability to object was there. But more importantly than that is that report was filed in July 13th, 2023 in, a in, the, in the sealed confidential guardianship docket. It was filed on the record and no objection was made then. 
Um, and we've gone to hearing after that where that was disclosed and no objection was made then. That objection has been waived. Um, it's been waived through actually doing nothing. And when it was brought up in court, there was another waiver there. So I'd ask that um, it be admitted and just go to the weight of, of the argument. We're not trying to get anyone in trouble here. We just, there are some issues. I'll sustain the objection. Okay. Um, did when, when um, Jaden got back, when Jaden would email you, um, you would, e would you email him back? Yes. And how many times would you say he called you? Um, I can tell you. Maybe a half a dozen. Okay. And did you always call him back? I either responded by phone or email. Okay. And did he email, when he emailed you, did you email him back? Yes. And was there ever time you sent him emails or you called him to engage him and he didn't respond? Yes. And do you have a number of those times? Uh, I would say probably about the same, half a dozen. Um, and uh, aside from the online parenting class, has dad taken any proactive steps to change his position? So I, I'll, I'll kind of counter that. Aside from quitting Domino's and going to the Forest Service five months ago, and also um, doing an online four-hour parenting class, has the father taken any proactive steps to change his position or to change his ability to parent? In, not in my opinion, he has not. As I said earlier, I think that the, some of the things that he has done have been to um, fulfill a, an appearance of compliance, but not actual improving his parenting skills. Okay, and just finally, um, well, more. Um, are you aware that the dog that scratches, did you see the scratches on the child's face um, from the daycare report? Had you I did. Okay. And were you made aware that the dog that was the issue also passed away? Did my clients report those things to you? I did not know that the, that, that particular dog passed away. Okay. And finally, um, just to, to end on this, um, I just want to reiterate it one more time. It's Isn't it true that until I gave you the document about Michelle Harrington's son, that father never disclosed that there was a sexual offender rape of a child living in the same home as him? Objection. Right. Sustained, did dad, this, sustained this to form. Did dad, did dad ever disclose everybody that was living in the house uh, where he was residing in Silverton? No. Thank you. No for the question. Recross? Yeah, uh, dad has always indicated he uh, is going to reside in Toledo, uh, Oregon, as soon as he gets custody of his daughter. Is that correct? If he gets custody, yes. Okay. Right. Um, and um, I, I want to go back to your recommendation uh, again, because you have said, well, you, you asked him to, to do parenting class, and he did one for you. He did. Well, he provided a certificate for a four-hour online parenting class. I um, do not have any information on whether he actually took the class or not, um, because he, he never provided me any details of what he learned in that class. Did, did you ask him for details of what he learned in the class? I did. Okay. Um, and um, uh, you, you are basing your request for a DV evaluation on this one incident of what occurred uh, at the um, the graduation fiasco. Your Honor, um, objection, ask and answer. This question has been asked no less than 10 times. She, she brought it up. Objection, objection is overruled. So you have no history of my client committing domestic violence or being violent or uh, being in bar fights or assaults or anything. Is that correct? Other than this incident with Ms. Crape uh, and the police were called that were ultimately dropped. Yeah. So what I what I had said was that my uh, recommendation for the DV evaluation was based on the incident with um, Kelly Crape, along with my observations of the uh, the anger outburst that I have seen a father make. Okay. And what anger outbursts were, are that? Is that during the court hearings? Okay.
have you talked to friends and family about his demeanor and attitude and propensity for anger outbursts? I don't specifically recall. Uh, I'd have to go back and look through my notes. Nothing further. I would like to call Melody Boone to the stand. Ms. Boone, um, how do you know Jaden Ludwig? Jaden is my daughter's ex-boyfriend. And what is your daughter's name? Caitlin Boone. Okay. And when were they together? From what period to what period? They were together from 2019 to, I want to say, 2021. Okay. And at some point, did they live in Spokane? Yes, they lived in Spokane a couple of times. Okay. And at some point, did they live with you? Yes, they did. They lived with me from um, right after Thanksgiving of 2020 to right before Easter of 2021. Okay. And why did they move in with you? They moved in with me because they were current before me, they were living with uh, Jaden's grandmother and they were very unhappy about how they were treated and how things were going. And my daughter was constantly calling me crying. And I told her that they were welcome to move in with me. Okay. And when they left, why did they leave your residence? They left because I had an altercation with Jaden and I said that the um, Jalen and Caitlin were welcome in my house, but Jaden no longer was welcome in my house. Okay. So let's kind of work back from that altercation. So tell me about that altercation. What happened? Um, Jaden wanted to smoke pot. And my thing was, is if you're going to smoke pot, it's outside of my house, not in my house. And when he'd go out to smoke pot, he would do it on my patio and he was constantly leaving the paraphernalia and stuff on my patio. And my problem was, is if someone comes over, I don't want them to see that, especially we have the baby. And so he had hide it behind my couch. And I walked in my house after work one day and he had a bong and um, weed behind my couch that I could see. And I took and disposed of it and said something to him. And that's when we got in a fight. Okay. And this bong and weed that were behind your couch, uh, where was the, where was the child um, when you walked in and you saw this, where was the child located at that point? She wasn't here. She was with her dad uh, picking up um, my daughter. Okay. And this altercation, kind of walk us through what happened. Was it physical, verbal? Talk us through it. It was all verbal. Um, I told him that it was not okay. And I was tired of him not listening and doing things around the house. I was tired of him not taking care of his child. And that if the pot was going to be his priority, then I wanted him gone. And he starts screaming and yelling at me and threatening to call the cops and freaking out. And I was like, you can go ahead. And when you say screaming and yelling at you, was he cursing at you? Was he calling you names? What, what do you mean by screaming and yelling? I can't exactly remember because it was so far back. Um, he was, I don't believe necessarily that he cursed at me. He could have, but he was screaming. He was mad. He wanted his food card, which I didn't have his food card. Um, my daughter did at that time and was accusing me of stealing his food card. And I hadn't stole it. The food card was given to me because he could not properly purchase food for the month for his child and him. Um, so it was given to me to purchase the food for them. Okay. And when he lived at your house, did he have a job? No, when he moved in, he was supposed to get a job and I told him I'd give him a chance. He stated that he had ADHD and that that was his problem with in getting a job. I told him, I understood that maybe we needed to get him a doctor's appointment and get him on um, medicine before we looked for a job. And I was willing to work with him with that. He stated, no, that is why he smoked pot. He did not want to get a doctor's appointment and get on medicine because he had a PSD, PSTD from childhood of being forced to take ADHD medicine. I said, well, Jaden, then I think the best choice for us is to maybe seek a counselor. If you want to seek a counselor and get some help prior to getting a job, I'm okay with that. Well, he flat refused to do any of that or even get a job. He did get a job like a day or two before he took the baby and my daughter and moved to um, his dad's house. Okay. And kind of going back to the screaming and yelling that's going on, uh, where was the child at when that was going on? She was um, in the bedroom with my daughter. Okay. Would she have been able to hear her dad screaming at you? Yes. Okay. About how many feet was the bedroom from the area of the altercation? I'd say maybe 50 feet. Okay. And now you said that part of it that you wanted him gone was because of how he took care of his child. Can you go into more detail uh, about that? Who, well, actually, let me, let me go through. Who did the, the normal parenting functions? Who bathed the child, fed the child, um, cleaned the child on a normal basis? Um, both my daughters and I did. Okay. Did you ever see uh, Jaden feed the child? Very rarely would I see him feed her. Okay. What about change the child? Was the child in diapers then? Yes, she was. 
Okay. Did you ever see him change diaper? If he changed a diaper, he had to be forced to change a diaper. And my daughter had to yell at him several times before he changed her diaper. Um, he would just sit there and play on his phone or not go change the diaper at all. Many times did I come home and Jalen was soaked in wet diapers as he was sitting on the couch or in his room or outside. Okay. And was there, you say soaked with uh, wet diapers, um, it, just knowing how that child was kind of taking care of, of her, what you saw about how long would it have taken to accumulate that much urine in some of these diapers you saw? I'm sorry. How I couldn't hear the question. I, I'm trying to figure out how long this child had been in that wet diaper. Did you, did you ever find out any of these times, how long the child had been in the wet diaper? She was in a wet diaper from the time my daughter left to work I in the morning. That they're, I'm going to object to foundation unless, you know, uh, is she guessing how long or is she absolutely no? I mean, I, there's no foundation laid for this testimony. Um, the objections noted overruled. She can answer if she knows. So Ms. Boone, Ms. Boone, that means you can answer if you know. She was in a wet diaper the whole time my daughter was at um, work. If my oldest didn't get out and change Jalen, or if I didn't come home in between my breaks, and that's why I would stop at the house for just a few minutes before going to my next client because I wanted to make sure Jalen was, you know, dry. And her diaper was pretty full that showed that she hadn't been changed in hours. Okay. And did you also find diapers anywhere else in the house? Did you yes, I found diapers when they moved out. I found diapers under clothes. I found them. Um, all through the bedroom. I also found a bag of diapers that I had asked him to take out right before they moved out was on my patio underneath a um, road cone. And the garbage can was only about 50 feet from that cone. And he just put it under there and put the cone over top of it. Okay. And um, so feeding the child, changing the diapers. Uh, did you ever see him bathe the, bathe the child? No, he did not bathe the child unless uh, one, actually one time he did. And that's because my daughter forced him. She said, you need to get in there and give your daughter a bath. But other than that, he didn't even bathe himself. But one time in the few months he lived at my house, let alone bathe Jalen. Okay. Um, did you ever see him put the child to bed? Did I ever keep the child in bed? Oh, no. Did you ever see him put the child to bed? No, it was usually my daughter or I. Okay. Did he play with the child? He did very little. Okay. When you were there and personally witnessing with your own eyes and both dad and child were home, where would dad be and where would child be most often? Most often he would be in doing whatever I'm doing. The, chi the child? Kayla, yes. She was always okay. with, usually with me and he was in the room. And what, was was he do what was he doing in the room? He was playing video games, playing on his phone, sleeping. Okay. Um, did... And so, uh, so they left and, um, when they left, or actually before that, um, during the time they lived with you, um, had you ever witnessed personally any type of angry outburst or any type of physical altercation or any sort of altercation by dad against anyone other than what you've already disclosed with you? No, I did not. Out of you, your daughters and Jade and Jaden, who took on the lion's share of the parenting duties of the child? My daughter, Caitlin. Um, I have no further questions. Wait, cross, cross examination. Uh, how old was Miss um, Boone? How old was Jaylen when uh, my client and your your daughter resided there? She was one. She was one. Okay. And they were only there for, would you say, two months? Yeah, they're only, they came. They left right before Easter of twenty. 21 and came right after Thanksgiving about that time. So they were at your house twice. Is that no, they no. were only at my house once they moved here in 2020, right after Thanksgiving and they left before okay. Easter. Got it. Okay. Got it. Uh, no further questions. Okay. Redirect. No, your honor. Okay, uh, Ms. Boone, thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're free to go. You're also free to, to observe. Just make sure your uh, phone's off, or pardon me, your, your camera's off and your mute's on. Yes, Ms. Greenwald. Um, how do you know Jaden Ludwig? Uh, he has been a family friend for a majority of his life, I think probably 12 years now. Okay, and tell me what you know, personally know, not what you've heard, but what you've personally seen um, in terms of Jaden and his parenting of the child. Um. I, it's, it's a lack of parenting. Um, that would be my judgment. 
I have been around Jaden multiple times uh, where he has been in the vicinity of his daughter. Uh, those occasions did take place at Miss Crepe's home. Um, Jaden was very disconnected, usually in a bedroom, on a phone, playing a video game, sometimes napping. Uh, and Jalen was left to the care of the other adults in the home, whether it was myself, a couple of my daughters, Kelly. Um, he was very absent. And can you tell me if you can remember uh, what time of the year or any dates or as good as close to an approximation of, of month and year as you can of some of those, those times? Um, I know that most of them were over the summer uh, after Jaden had come to stay with Kelly. I don't know dates right off the top of my head. I apologize. That's that's right. It happened before the police incident with the... Oh, yes. Yes, it was before then. Okay. And about how often were you at that house? Um, I would say two or three times a month, maybe. It was typically on a weekend. Kelly and I have always been extremely close. We raised our kids together, so we would do... Saturday, we'd come in an afternoon, do dinner together, hang out throughout the evening, and me and my children would go home. So okay. typically, it was a weekend. Okay. And so that's when you saw uh, the child essentially being left to the other adults? Yes. Okay. And at some point, uh, Jaden got kicked out of uh, that house, correct? He did. And did you do anything in order to connect with him? I did. I reached out to him, I believe at that time, via social media on Facebook Messenger, just to make sure he was okay. Always... I've checked on Jaden off and on basically his whole life, making sure he was okay. I know he's kind of had some rough spots and um, I feel we were very close. So I've always had that caring relationship for him. So I did reach out to him afterwards to make sure he was okay and that he was safe. And you say he's had some rough spots. What do you mean by that? And when he was in high school, he ran away once. I don't remember all the details. Um, I know he butted heads with his dad I mean, a couple of times. I'm object to this. There's no foundation unless okay. the things my client you know, told her or something. So the objections uh, noted it's overruled. He's indicated she's been with the family friends for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. You can Excuse continue me. your answer. So um, I've always kind of made sure to check in on Jaden, knowing that, you know, he's had some challenging times. He's um, told me there's times he doesn't get along with his grandparents or times he didn't get along with his dad and Kelly. He ran away. He had issues at school. I've always played a motherly role in his life and have always continued to check on Jaden. Okay. And you also were there... Um, now, did you did you have any personal knowledge of the day uh, Caitlin left um, the residence and broke up with Jaden? I don't. Okay. I don't have uh, a lot there. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. Um, now, during the protection order um, that was entered, you know the protection order, correct? Between I do. Okay. And so that protection order was entered in June of 21 through August of 22. During that time, from June 21 to August 22, um, did you reach out to Jaden? I did. Okay. And what did you reach out to him? What was the purpose of you reaching out to him? I periodically just kind of checked on him. Hey, how are you? How's life? Um, I've asked a couple of times, you know, have you gotten a job yet? Where are you living? Just motherly curiosity. Um, the information disclosed between me and Jaden was never relayed back to Kelly. That was kind of always a thing between Jaden and I. I felt that I was always a safe space for him. So he was pretty open with me about a lot of stuff. Did you ever offer him the ability to use your house to see the child so that that restraining order wouldn't be violated? I, I think I may have via a Facebook message. I don't, I don't recall if I did or not. Did the child, was the child ever in your care um, when Kelly wasn't there? Oh yes. Yeah. And um, did you contact Jaden at any time during those visits? Um, I know that I had contact with him. I don't know if I reached out to Jaden specifically because I had Jalen. I do know that I post on social media pictures of, of Jalen and I out together doing things. And I've had conversation with Jaden and he's never reached out to me to say, hey, can I call you? I see you have Jalen today. Or can you call me the next time you have her so I can talk to her or FaceTime me? I mean, he's never as much asked me, how is she? Or is she okay? I mean, even during, I think her second birthday party, I reached out to him and sent him pictures. I asked Kai, you know, made sure there was no discrepancy that he could have pictures of her. Kai said, yeah, that's fine. I sent him some pictures during uh, Jalen's second birthday party. She was dressed as Minnie Mouse. And there wasn't even as much as, you know, can you tell her daddy says happy birthday or tell her daddy says, you know, I miss her. I love her. Can I send her a present or a card? None of that was there. None of it. Okay. Um, in your opinion, you're a mother. Is that correct? I do. Yes. I have three so, children. Um, uh, what you've seen personally with your own eyes and ears um, as a mother, um, do you believe that um, he has shown um, the ability to parent a child? I do not think so. No. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Cross-examination. Do you know uh, Teresa Ludwig? I have only met her a couple of times. It's been quite some time. Okay. 
Um, are you aware that Kai Ludwig uh, lived uh, with uh, the Jaden and his sister in, at Teresa Ludwig's house in yes. Toledo, Oregon? You're aware of that yeah, for a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, are you aware that uh, Jaden uh, wants custody of his daughter returned to him yeah. uh, and that he would be residing with Teresa Ludwig uh, in uh, Toledo, Oregon? Are that is what I've heard. I don't. I don't know that I've heard that from Jaden, but that is what I've heard just via court. Yes. Have you seen Jaden with uh, Jalen? Uh, yes, I have. Okay. How's their relationship? Um, I have not seen him with Jalen since he's had his weekend visitation. The last time I saw him with her was at her third birthday party. Um, the bond there was was very disconnected. He hadn't seen her in a while, though. Prior to that was when he was living with Miss Crepe and Kai Ludwig, and there was a, a big disconnect there. Okay. Uh, so you saw him with Jalen when he came up uh, to, to get Jalen? Uh, what? I'm, I'm sorry. When uh, was and, that? Uh, you, you said he hadn't seen her from some, for some time. Uh, and oh, at her third birthday party. At he her showed third up. birthday party. Yeah. Uh, and that was um, after uh, he realized that the protection order was dropped and he had come up a week or so prior to that. And then he came up for the birthday party. Yes. When he came to the birthday party is when I witnessed that's probably the most, that's the actually the only interaction I think I've seen with him, ha him have with Jalen um, since he resided with Miss Crape and Kai Ludwig. Okay. And how long have you been a friend of Miss um, Crape? Um, since 2000 and 2001. Okay. So a 20 year uh, friendship? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I don't think I have any further questions. Okay. Redirect? No, you aren't. Um, I'm done with this witness. Okay, Ms. Greenwell, thank you very much. Uh, you're, you're free to go. You're free to also just uh, observe. If you want to turn off your camera and mute your microphone, that's acceptable. Um, thank you. So just addressing the, the parties. Um, Can I get one more in? It should be really quick. Oh, famous last words and promises. I, I promise on this one. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's give it a shot. Let's go ahead. Uh, Kathleen, and I might pronounce this wrong, Hyla. Ms. Hyla, uh, were you the former director of We Care Daycare? Yes, I was. Okay. And when you were the director of there, did uh, Jalen, was she um, a student there? Yes, she was. Okay. And did you witness um, her developmental abilities when she came to the school? Yes, I did. And can you tell us a little bit about those? What was she like um, when she came? Yes, when I was first directing, uh, she was pretty far behind in her development. Um, we administer what is called an ASQ, an Ages and Stages questionnaire. And according to that documentation, she was um, developmentally behind. Um, she was not speaking at the time. Um, and that was the, the major concern there. Um, it is a preschool, so there are like learning activities and different things like that um, with our curriculum. And we noticed that that was something uh, she was delayed in. So we did um, reach out to Kelly, um, who was caring for her at the time, and and um, ask them to go ahead and continue with a referral for the Progress Center. Okay. And were you there as she continued and you still there when she was dismissed from the Progress Center? I can't recall if I was still there when she was um, dismissed from it. I, I think she was still in the Progress Center by the time um, I had left the company. Okay. And had you witnessed any, um, any growth, any hitting milestones um, in that development? Yes, absolutely. So Jalen was there um, basically five days a week unless she was sick. Um, and so I saw her development every day along um, that time. And she, we noticed that her language had increased. She was starting to speak when I first started. She did not have any words. It was mainly like noises she would make or gestures that she would get her point across to us. And as we had her in our care and she continued with the progress center, we did see her develop new language skills between sign language and using her voice. Um, she was working on potty training and different things like that by the time I was leaving. And she was um, getting pretty close to being completely caught up developmentally. Okay. And during the entire time that you were there from the time that she got there to the time you left, um, had you ever met, spoken to, or had any contact at all with Jaden Sloan, her biological father? No. Okay. Jane Ludwig. Um, Jane Ludwig. I'm sorry, Jaden Ludwig. My, my apologies. Yeah, no, I did not. Okay. Did you, um, did he ever request any information by mail? No. Okay. Um, had you, did you see any restraining order on file in the school uh, that didn't allow him to go there? No. Okay. Um, if he had called, would you have known that um, there was a restraining order between him and Kelly? Uh, I would not have known that because we don't keep um, that type of records on file um, regarding the child, but he would have only spoken to me, so he would have been able to make that call. Okay. And you don't work there anymore, correct? Correct. And when was your last day? 
That's a great question. Um, I think it was around July of 21. Oh, 22, I, 22, oh, sorry, 22. Okay, I have no further questions, thank you. Cross-examination. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Hyla. Um, Kelly Crape worked there at the daycare while you were there, is that correct? Correct. And she was there every day? Uh, this, yeah, yeah, she worked Monday through Friday. Okay. Um, and uh, um, Jay Lynn required uh, tubes put in her ears. She had uh, hearing issues. Correct. You're, you're aware of that. So, yeah. Uh, and that happens frequently. Am I wrong? Um, yeah, I would say it's, it depends on the child. It usually has to do with how many ear infections they have. Um, and if they're resolved and it's, it's kind of dependent on the child, but I would say we've had quite a handful of children who do have to get, um, tubes put in their ears because of chronic ear infections and it doesn't influence their hearing. Okay. Uh, and how old are the children, uh, when they get, uh, the tubes in their ears? Uh, that varies. It, there's not like a, a prescribed um, age that they have to be at in order to get tubes put in their ears. It is typically dependent on how many ear infections they've had. Is it influencing their hearing in any way? And what does the doctor recommend? So the children we served, it was typically um, children under the age of five that we would see, but over the age of one. Okay. Over one and under five. Yes. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. No further questions. Thank you. Uh, redirect, Ms. Winkles. No, you are. Okay, Ms. Isla, thank you very much. Um, you're, you're excused. If you want to continue to observe the proceedings, you can. Just turn off your camera and, and make sure you're muted. Um, so as far as the today's witnesses, we'll go ahead and bring it to a close today. I appreciate everybody's efforts. Uh, we will be here tomorrow. We'll, we'll, we'll be here via Zoom again tomorrow. And let's plan on uh, being ready to go at 9.15. Um, I'm hoping, I'm pretty sure my, that hearing at 9 will be completed by 9.15. And um, We'll continue with the trial. Any any final issues before we break for the day from either party, Mr. Anagnostu, Ms. Winkles? Yeah, I will have three witnesses to left tomorrow. I expect them to take under an hour. Um, I Holly Ludwig, 10 minutes, kind of just like before Cameron Cannon, 10 minutes. Um, it'll be Kai Ludwig that will take the majority of my, um, my questioning of him will be brief, but Mr. Anagnostu um, may want to have quite a cross. So um, I, I probably will take an hour in the morning. I'm hoping that's okay. Okay. All right, uh, Mr. Anagnostu, any any uh, final items from you today? Um, just so we are starting at nine fifteen. Yes, sir. Okay, I just want to I want to get that time because I for some reason I keep thinking nine thirty and I don't want to be fifteen minutes late. Yeah, let's just say nine o'clock and then you'll be right on time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably. <laughs> That's what my mom does to me. It seems to work. So. Right. 